What's up, everybody, and welcome to episode 173 of the Passionate DJ Podcast. I'm your host, David Michael, and today we're doing sort of a recap episode of the uh, 2019 NAM show. Now, this happened at the end of last month. This happens every year. NAM show is a really big deal, and the reason it's exciting for us DJs is because that's a chance for us to kind of see the latest and greatest in DJ gear, uh, musical instruments, and uh, you know the technology surrounding all of these things. I had the opportunity to go to my first NAM show, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about my experience at the show now that it's uh, I've been back for a week or two now uh, back to uh, less than ideal temperatures compared to California here in Ohio Um, but it was quite an adventure there was a lot to see and uh, you know it was pretty overwhelming there was a lot to do the convention center is huge everywhere I looked there was just cool modular synths to look at and turntables and uh, even cellos and pianos and horns and I mean just anything um, that any kind of music nerd would just be in heaven it was really awesome to see Now, for those of you who are listening at home on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app, which is most of you who listen to the Passionate DJ podcast, um, a lot of this content is going to be sort of repurposed from the YouTube channel, from Passionate DJ YouTube channel. And so while most of this is going to translate okay to the audio version of the show, um, there is sort of an enhanced version of this to see that you can check out by just going to youtube.com slash passionate DJ. Uh, As you know, we've been doing a lot of work on the Passionate DJ YouTube channel, and much of the content you're going to hear in today's show um, is just going to be sort of repurposed from the individual videos that I put together, and then uh, at the end of the show, sort of wrap it up with things that I didn't actually cover on the YouTube channel. And uh, so hopefully for those of you who don't mind a little bit of repeat content, there will be some extra stuff in there for you to listen to. And for those of you who listen at home on the podcast app rather than checking out YouTube, uh, this gives you a chance to sort of have this recap and know what's been going on in the DJ and technology space. So I hope you enjoy this episode. We're going to talk primarily about the Denon DJ Prime 4, the Akai Force, uh, just a couple of quick updates on the Rain 12 and the Rain 72, the Reloop Elite Mixer, the Reloop RP8000 Mark II turntable, the phase technology that we've talked about. It's like wireless DVS or timecode control, and then some recent tractor updates. Now, once again, this is a recap episode of a bunch of gear. There's going to be a lot of technical jargon and a lot of details and stats. And so this might not be the episode for everybody. This one's uh, more nerdy in that uh, respect. Um, For others, you know, you might just be able to blow past some of the technical jargon and just get the main bullet points. But uh, I hope you enjoy. And uh, let's get on to my coverage of NAM 2019. My first trip to the NAM show was, in a word, overwhelming. There was a lot to see, and I don't think I could have visited every booth I wanted to if my life depended on it. Still, it was a very exciting time for me to witness the hustle and bustle of this iconic show. NAM is an annual event described as the world's largest trade-only event for the music products, pro audio, and event tech industry. NAM stands for the National Association of Music Merchants and was founded in 1901. It's a business show which caters to dealers and distributors, with the main draw being product exhibits where manufacturers show off their latest in music products and technology. Now, of course, only a very small percentage of the NAM displays are DJ related, but it was still pretty difficult to cover all the bases. So ultimately, I just decided to focus on a few key items that I thought would be the most important to our passionate DJ audience and cover those well, going deep rather than wide. So I got on a plane from Ohio where there was snow and ice on the ground, flew across the entire country, over the snow-covered plains and beautiful Rocky Mountains, and many hours later I was enjoying the sunny, low 70s weather of the West Coast in January, and it was glorious. Anaheim was beautiful and the convention center is located almost on top of Disneyland. The walk to and from the show was a sea of convention badges and mouse ears. Inside the convention center I barely knew what to do. You can go in any direction up any escalator and there will be another part of NAM there just waiting to be explored. So I did what any content creator in the DJ space would do in 2019. I went to the In Music Room, which is a company that owns several manufacturers you've heard of, including Denon DJ. 
Now, Denon's been making big waves in the last year or two, and several weeks ago they dropped a huge controller bomb, the Denon Prime 4. What's up, passionate DJs? Coming at you from NAM 2019 here in the hotel room, and I've had a chance to spend some time with something that's been all the buzz in the DJ world here at NAM, and that is the Denon DJ Prime 4. But it's been really nice to be able to spend some actual hands on time with this thing. But let me just give you a quick overview of some of the features. Of course, it's a four deck standalone engine prime DJ system. Of course, that means you can leave your laptop at home. It's got detailed 24 bit Denon DJ legacy audio. It's got an adjustable 10 inch touchscreen with gesture support. It has a dedicated XLR zone output, which provides music to a separate room. It's got a built-in 2.5-inch SATA drive bay to store music on board. It has a 6-inch jog wheel with an HD central display, four assignable input channels for external media sources, two dedicated XLR inputs for microphones with individual control. It plays uncompressed audio formats like FLAC, ALAC, and WAVE, and it has four USB and one SD media input for music playback and recording. Now once again, check out the full first look video that I posted a few days ago on the YouTube channel, but I did want to bring you to this conversation which I had with the Denon DJ rep there at the In Music Room here at NAMM 2019, and he showed me some interesting things about the Prime 4 that maybe you didn't know before, so let's go have a look. All right, I'm here with Jay from Denon DJ, and we're looking at the highly anticipated Denon Prime 4. At its very core essence, it's a four-channel standalone DJ console, the world's first, which is has been great because clearly it's a product, uh, a feature that people have wanted for a long, long time. So to be able to get this out is fantastic. We've got uh, obviously the beautiful centerpiece that we have right in there is the 10-inch high definition. That is lovely. It's um, it, it really is amazing. I mean, it's we've also not been greedy with the retail space. You know, you go to Library View and you have you know nice kind of clear indication of play playlist you can really see really easily what's going on and be able to kind of manage your files. The zone feature again is one that we're very kind of excited about so all we need to do if I'll give you a quick demonstration here so I hit the zone button to activate it it says this will stop the playback on deck four you say that's fine hit continue and now that that channel is now waiting for a playlist I simply just go to the library pick my playlist and I hit the center zone button and there you go, that, that fourth channel is now dedicated. I go to pl play uh, deck four, hit play, and now that is going to a completely separate location. So you, you can essentially DJ in two rooms now. Could you give some scenarios where that might be useful? And one, yeah. If you're in sort of a bar DJ and they have like a foyer or, or a restaurant or something like that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, um, you know, a, a classic example is being a, a wedding uh, DJ where you obviously have a setup in the main room. You may have cocktail hour in another room. You may want to set a different ambience. Maybe sure. it's kind of sort of chill lounge, maybe classical, you know, whatever it may be. Um, it's about kind of setting a different mood in a different area. Uh, if you're a bar, as you quite rightly said, you might want to have the DJ be able to control what's going on the main floor but maybe have different music going on uh, in the smoking area in the cloakroom in the toilets I mean you know uh, we're actually very interested to hear what Pete how Pete other people think they would like to use it you know if you're at home you may have the main barbecue area set like this and you might want to set some entrance music to the house yeah, sure. you know uh, you're doing Facebook live streams and you may want to kind of set something out to go separately I mean really there are so many scenarios that we thought of but we we genuinely cannot wait until people start using using and go, oh, I can use it for this, I can use it for that. There's like, what, four USB ports, an SD card, and an internal SD uh, SATA drive, uh, SATA drive sl yeah. slot. So, I mean, you could, essentially, you could be playing off your internal hard drive and then have your new tunes on a thumb drive, and then you could do a B2B set with, like, two friends, and you would still have... Five friends. Five <laughs> yeah, right, and still have a spot left over, yeah. yeah so, yeah. And, and you can connect, a, what, an external QWERTY keyboard, USB yes, keyboard to this yes, thing? Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, what can't you do with this thing? I mean, it won't get you gigs. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. The display is multi-touch 
capable. Yeah. So like uh, what kind of UI stuff are we looking at here? You have your performance view here. So that gives you a clear view of all the vertical waveforms. Uh, it's been very heavily requested uh, about horizontal waveforms. So I do want to kind of pitch that okay. before you ask. Um, it's definitely in there for future development. We've seen how kind of popular that, that request is. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely in there for, for a future update. If I just toggle to the library view here, so I've got access to crates, playlists, my prepare folder. Yeah, if I want to view uh, actually as like kind of a finder, Windows Explorer type view, and I've got the search. So even though you can put in a QWERTY keyboard, uh, an external keyboard, there is a really nice kind of big yeah. QWERTY keyboard that's on there as well. So the features to be able to filter and search stuff by our, our artist album, you've got the BPM as well, so you can set a specific BPM. You can set the filter tolerance for that. So I think this one's set to plus or minus 3%. So if I go to say 100 BPM, and load that up, you'll get all of those oh, that's great. That plus or minus three. Now, you click on this, and you've got a nice clear menu to be able to choose by BPM oh, wow. key, year. So if we did that's say terrific. BPM, and I can sort that by ascending or descending as well. Um, so we, we've really tried to look at the kind of usability and functionality. It's so packed full of features, but trying to make sure that it's it's simple and straightforward and sure. intuitive to, to use. You know, that was very key. There's a lot going on here, and we've had a lot of comments, which is very nice, is that the, it's not all squashed and packed in. Right. Uh, everything's kind of got its own space, you know. Uh, whether you're uh, familiar with the SE5000 and the, the, the Prime series, uh, you know, this layout will be very familiar and, and new people to it. Again, you know, we've not... Everything's got its own space and it, it is where it's supposed to be. Um, and you know, it's very important to stress that um, this is part of the ever expanding Prime family. You know, yes. we've got the SC5000, the X1800, the M, the VL12, and now the Prime 4 joins that family. So, uh, this is really showing Dell and DJ's commitment to this range and ensuring that we are really catering for all different types of DJs, requirements, style of DJing as well, and, and keeping them, you know, all within that kind of trusted Prime on build. Some of the other key features uh, which is the ability to be able to change the key of the song. So I've got the Camelot notation down here so I just click that and I can now go up or down 12 semitones to be able to change the key of the song. Okay yeah. Uh, if I hold down key lock on the other deck I can then do key syncing as well so that's a new feature okay. that's never been added. It's not new to software but it's new to hardware. Sure, sure. Uh, and again, that's another feature that we'll be rolling out on the SE5000s and the 5000Ms. Uh, the record feature on here is, is so beautifully simple. Um, I just hold down there, hit record, hit start, and I'm now recording. That's great. How do you select the, uh, the recording destination? So we've got one internal uh, SATA drive installed in here, so that is record. It knows that is the default. It will record to the same drive that is streaming four sources of music. Wow. So you could be playing four channels of audio and recording 44.1 WAV file directly to it. Wow. I can actually choose, if I had multiple devices in, it would come up with an option to say, where do you want to record this? So. Gotcha, okay. Features. This does actually come with uh, integration into Sound Switch, which is the lighting control system, and also Resolume as well. And I believe there's a trial period that comes with uh, Prime. Okay. As well as this kind of being, you know, the most advanced all-in-one solution for the professional DJ, we're also giving them that true one-man band to be able to right. integrate into lighting and, and visual control as well. I think I read somewhere that there's uh, plans to integrate with uh, or to have Serato DJ yeah, capability yeah. and uh, Tractor as well. Uh, so with Serato, it's going to be Serato uh, Serato DJ ready, and so we just very soon after this being shipped it will be available we're waiting for the next update for Serato so you'll be able to if you want to connect it to a, a laptop and use those features you absolutely can uh, with the tractor integration at the moment engine prime software which is our free librarian management software you can import your tractor collection into engine prime it will import your playlist cue points and loop points and from there it will convert it to the engine format you then export it to a USB Beautiful. in here and you got that tractor experience laptop free beautiful and I should probably also point out just while we're talking about that integration with record box you can put a record box drive in here as you can with any SC5000 or M it will import all of your playlist cues and loops it does about 2,000 tracks every minute so very quick you can load those songs instantly you got access to your hot cues and everything it'll rewrite the new beat grid uh, 
you know, the integration for this, you know, it's very important for us to be able to be as open as possible. You know, uh, DJs have all different ways of DJing. We, we want to make sure that, you know, they're able to experience that. I think our audience really appreciates that. Well, Jay, thank you so much for spending some time with me. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Now, most of the comments on the YouTube channel had to do with comparing this unit to Pioneer gear, uh, specifically the XDJ RX2, which would be the uh, kind of closest Pioneer equivalent, uh, being that it's a standalone unit, doesn't require a laptop, does basically all the same stuff, uh, but of course this thing feature-wise just blows the Pioneer unit out of the water and comes in at a cheaper price point. So, uh, you know, one commenter said, wow, now over to Pioneer. Uh, a lot of people kind of had similar reactions to this, just looking at Pioneer and kind of wondering where they're going to go from here because Denon seems to have kind of done a mic drop. Another commenter said, the real killer feature here is actually the software. The ability to deal with both record box, tractor, and Serato files basically makes Denon the first semi-open DJ format platform that comes with killer hardware. Another viewer posts, I'm really excited for what Denon has been bringing to the market recently. They've really been pushing the innovation in technology, which Pioneer has been somewhat lacking in, and blurring the lines between players and controller and software setups. Hopefully Pioneer has been taking note and starts giving more from their standalone systems instead of bumping up the price for very little extra features. Now no doubt the Prime 4 was one of the most talked about things this year. Uh, all the people in our Passionate DJ community group wanted to know about this thing. Uh, PassionateDJ.com slash community to get access to that. It's our Facebook group. Um, everybody's asking about the Prime 4 and this next item which was also in the in music room which is the Akai Force which is sort of like an MPC like device but squished into the form factor of something like an Ableton Push. This thing is like a standalone digital workstation studio you can uh, it's got a grid of pads and you can hammer out beats and do sequencing and uh, play instruments and do all this kind of stuff uh, similar to my machine studio that i have in the background of my studio uh, but this is a standalone device of course no laptop required being sort of a theme this year uh, so let's explore the akai force What's up, passionate DJs? Coming to you from NAM 2019, and one of the biggest buzzes we've been hearing about throughout this trip is the Akai Force. Now, this is basically a standalone music production workstation or standalone music production studio, as they call it, in this uh, nice little pamphlet that I picked up at their booth. This is the sort of situation where there's no computer required. You can actually start easily banging out beats and creating entire songs on the unit itself using onboard storage, no laptop required. However, it is also fully functional as an Ableton Live controller. It has integrated support so that it gives you total visibility and command of the clip matrix, tactile control of core mixer parameters, including crossfader assignments, and full control of Ableton devices via forces knobs and OLED displays. So no matter how you want to use this thing, whether it's attached to a computer or not, this is going to be the device for you if you like anything that's sort of like that, uh, say, machine studio kind of workflow. Now it includes a 7-inch full-color multi-touch display. It has four internal synthesizer engines called Hype, Tube Synth, Electric, and Bassline. It has eight audio tracks with real-time stretching, three step sequencer pad modes called Drum, Melodic, and Lanes, several different note modes including chromatic, scales, chords, progressions, and more. And storage-wise, it includes a full-sized SD card slot and it's got a user expandable two and a half inch SATA drive slot. So if you want to have internal storage on the thing, you can do that using the onboard connector. Also, it's Wi-Fi and Bluetooth compatible and it already includes 16 gigabytes of onboard storage, including 10 gigs of sound content. It also fully integrates with Splice, an online music creation platform that offers over two million royalty free samples, loops and presets and helps musicians work together on tracks. Now, everybody really seemed to want to get a piece of this thing, and so here are some of the cool things I learned about the Akai Force during my time here at NAMM. Now, there was a lot of buzz around the Akai booth, and with good reason. 
The force seems well built, not that there was any doubt, and it seemed to leave a positive impression on everyone that spent a few moments with it. Well, first, the unit sounds really nice. The included sounds in the onboard synthesizer engines make for a pleasing auditory experience. Now speaking of synths, here are the super nerdy details for those of us who really like that sort of thing. First is Hype, which combines four different types of synthesizer, wavetable, FM, subtractive, and sampling, with a giant preset library that makes for great hard-hitting plucks and lead melodies. Next is Tube Synth, which is sort of a polysynth emulator with an advanced analog modeling algorithm for a classic vintage sound, which includes five effects. And then there's Baseline for creating classic monosynth sounds. It does this by utilizing variable oscillator wave shapes, sub and fifth oscillators, low and high pass options, and four integrated effects of its own. And finally, there's Electric, which is sort of an e-piano simulator. It includes pickup, envelope, bell, and noise parameter sections, and five more integrated effects. Now the Force is great for DJ producer types and perfectly bridges that gap without having to involve a computer. DJs can seamlessly assign tracks to the crossfader, load full tracks, stems or loops into the pad matrix, and fuse this all together with scene and clip playback. It's a remix or a mashup artist's dream. The Force warps all of your tracks together, sort of Ableton style, for seamless syncing of all your audio to a master BPM, and actually supports the Ableton Link protocol for seamless wireless synchronization to external sources. At 8.5 pounds, and being over a little over a foot wide, the Akai Force packs a lot of punch in a reasonably sized package, and it looks beautiful to boot. It comes in at just under 1500 bucks, which is not bad considering that it's basically a music production computer workstation, and it'll be available sometime mid-February. Now before leaving the room, another InMusic brand is Rain, and so I wanted to make sure I stopped by the Rain booth and talked to them a little bit because there have actually been a couple of recent updates to some of their gear, specifically the Rain 12s digital turntable. Uh, of course, they had their Rain 12s and the Rain 72 mixer set up on display there, and I was able to uh, get into a conversation with one of their representatives named Gus, and he told me about some of the improvements they've made based on customer or feedback to the Rain 12. So let's have a listen. Modern scratch DJs have really taken to the Rain 12s and the Rain 72 mixer. During my time at NAM this year, I wanted to make sure and talk to the Rain team about these well received pieces of gear. Here's a quick refresher on the hardware. The Rain 12s are turntables, or really battle controllers, meant to be used with Serato DJ. They feature a high torque, adjustable motor, and a high platter resolution. Now using its USB MIDI interface, it can connect directly to a Rain 72 mixer or to your computer, and it basically works like a turntable from there. Except of course there's no tone arm or needle to worry about, and the other giveaway is that there's a strip search with access to 8 hotcue triggers. Now using the 12, the DJ can scratch and play with all the precision and creativity of a turntablist, but with the convenience of a digital setup. The Rain 72 is a two-channel battle mixer with dual USB sound card. It features a 4.3 inch touchscreen, solid steel construction, contactless Mag3 faders with tension adjust, 16 Akai Pro MPC performance pads, and stacked Serato and post fader flex effects. Now the combo of this hardware is meant for a smooth Serato experience for the modern turntablist. In the in music room at NAMM, I found the Rain booth and asked about the latest updates to this gear. This is Gus, and he was happy to tell me all about the setup. I wanted to talk here about uh, kind of some of the changes that have been made recently to the 12s and just kind of like why DJs are so excited about these things. Best thing about it, well, with the 72 and the 12s is 
ideally the 72 is built to work with the 12 since it has the two USB ports on the back so you don't have to take up more USB ports on your um, computer because it is an all digital setup. There are no audio outputs on this. A lot of DJs did start off traditionally with turntables. Now you're getting back to that real turntable feel. Um, you can use it for clubs, parties, I know wedding DJs. And now, like we were saying, with no tone arm, there's no needles, you're uh, saving money on replacing stylus. Um, you don't have to worry about the isolation of noise or the bass in the clubs, there's gonna be no rumbling, so you don't have to worry about the record skipping or anything like that. So it just makes it a better overall controller and you get a great feel with the large platters, better durability control. Torque is great. Torque is kind of ideal, identical to maybe like a Technique's turntable, but you also get the, uh, the adjustment on underneath for the low and the high. Okay. So you can get like a different feel and really get the customization of how you want the record to feel when you're scratching too. You'll notice now, it's, uh, they originally shipped with the original vinyl, they went to the white acrylic. Now we've got the acrylic grooved vinyl, so the DJs that were used to the grooves of the vinyl of the records got that, but they also got the durability of an acrylic vinyl that won't wear and tear, it won't warp due to the heat. With the wires in the back, they couldn't rock it club style. So now one of the last changes they've also made, if we look here, see that, but the wires are now recessed, you probably can have to go around the side back, but. You can see that all the wires are hidden underneath now. So there's a little cavity where you can hide the wires, tuck them away, the power switch, the high, low torque button is underneath there. So now if uh, you want to flip your tables back club style, you can do that, or you can rock it vital style, however you want it. So it kind of makes it a little bit more useful for every DJ aspect out here. So those are pretty much a few of the updates we've had to the 12s. Uh, obviously the 72, pretty much the same. They've added the post fader effects in Serato and with our built-in flex effects. Uh, they improved the pad response time to, I believe, under 2 milliseconds. I believe it's like 1.5 and now, something like that. So they're pretty close to almost like an MPC pad. Not exactly, but that's what they're going after. And also, the paddles are customizable as well. If you want to be sideways, left and right, you can do that as well. So kind of gives the DJ a little bit more play around with how they want their setup too. And obviously, the high-def display here, you can zoom in on the track, zoom out. They now have added the loop feature here, so you can loop the records instantly with just this push of the scroll knob. And it'll give you their four bar loops, your eight bar loops right up here. But there's a few more improvements on the way from the range 72 and 12s. And so you have it. Now, another company that made a big splash at NAMM this year was ReLoop, specifically because of the ReLoop Elite Mixer and, of course, their turntable, the ReLoop RP8000 Mark II. Uh, we're going to take a look at the Elite really quick. This is sort of a Pioneer S9-like battle style mixer. Uh, has the performance pads right above the uh, two channel faders. So sort of that Serato battle style scratch mixer uh, brought into the modern era. has been very popular um, in the Rain 72 world, and so this is a very similar mixer in that vein. So let's have a look. Reloop had a good presence at NAMM, and they made sure to have plenty of great examples of exhibitionist DJing to demonstrate that their gear is up to the task. Now first, let's talk about the Reloop Elite. This is a high-performance DVS mixer for Serato, which Reloop has made a point of developing alongside international turntable artists. At an advertised price of $12.99, it provides a slightly better price point than the comparable Pioneer S9. Now, in my experience, Reloop gear is pretty well built, so I have no doubt that the same goes for the Elite. I watched the display units take a beating all weekend. The Elite features 16 large, velocity-sensitive RGB performance pads, allowing you to control up to 12 performance modes per deck. It also includes a 24-bit USB interface, and the faders are high-quality, non-contact Innofader Pros. The mixer also features two high-contrast OLED displays showing real-time information of effects, BPM, beat divisions, and the setup menu. Now around the back there are SmartLink USB ports which have auto RP8000 Mark II deck recognition, though the ports can also be used as an active USB hub for other external devices. And that brings us to those Mark IIs. There were a number of turntables on display at NAMM, notably the latest version of the classic Techniques 1200s, but Reloop's piece seems notably more forward-thinking. 
This turntable was designed for a seamless integration with Serato DJ Pro, offering the possibility of controlling up to seven different performance modes via its own onboard pads. Now, using platter play mode, the pads can be used to control the platter's rotation speed to create melodies and authentic musical performances. Now, it has a statically balanced S-shaped tone arm and improved tone arm base over the previous model, and it features an adjustable torque and brake right there on the top. Now, using a combination of metal, rubber, and synthetic materials, the Mark II is steady and reinforced, and this helps it be resistant to vibrations and shock, and the surface is coated with a deep black metallic finish that's scratch-resistant. Now we brought up the RP8000 Mark II and there was a lot of uh, turntables on display at NAMM including the Technics Mark VII version of the SL1200. Now somebody on the YouTube channel yelled at me for my pronunciation of Technics. Uh, some people say Techniques. I'll leave that up to you to decide. I did look it up to check because I figured somebody would complain and I read it as Technics. Your mileage may vary. But in any case, this is the Mark VII version of the turntable. I got a little bit of an opportunity to spend some time with it, so let's have a look. This past weekend at NAMM, I got to see the brand new Technics turntable, the Mark VII. Let's have a look. Ah, the classic Technics 1200, a staple in DJ booths for decades, though it was originally launched as an audiophile record player for listening purposes. A few weeks ago, Panasonic unveiled the Mark VII version of this icon, and over the weekend, I got to spend a few moments with the new player at NAMM 2019. The design is slightly more minimalist, now presented in a shadowy matte black style, and while the design hasn't changed much, they have made a few new additions. Now first, they expanded the pitch range. By hitting a new button above the control, you can change from the normal plus and minus 8% to plus and minus 16%. Under the platter is a switch that enables a reverse function, and another that changes the LED illumination to blue. Buried further down are some adjustments to the torque and brake speed, though most DJs will just want to let the 1200 do what a 1200 does. The direct drive motor has been improved and now it's coreless. Now the company says that the intent of this is to reduce what's called cogging, which is basically just a variation in rotation speed. The stock torque matches that of the Mark V. Plus the new 1200s do have detachable phono and power cables, thank god. Now the murdered out finish does look pretty good and they seem to perform well, but the new decks cost $1,200 each. Now I realize these things are an icon, but Technics are clearly resting on their name. First of all, the power switch, strobe light, and overall lesser weight of the new model gives the 1200 less of that sturdy tank feeling. Plus it still requires a ground peg. One of the most common modifications to Tech 12s over the years has been the elimination of the ground cable, but here we are in 2019. And while it's easy to understand the company's propensity towards preserving an icon, it's hard to justify the price point considering what's available on the market now for nearly half the price. And for an example, we only have to go literally around the corner where Reloop did a bang up job of showing the Mark II version of the RP8000. The new Reloop turntable is designed for seamless integration with Serato DJ Pro, and they tout it as the most advanced DJ turntable ever made. Developed in close cooperation with renowned turntable artists, it lets you get creative with its built-in features, especially when used in combination with the Reloop Elite Mixer. It contains seven new RGB colored performance pad modes, and one of the cool things that you can do is enable the new platter play mode, and it's actually pretty cool. In this mode, the performance pads can be used to control the speed of the platter, and it allows you to create sort of melodic musical performances and play the turntable like a piano. In fact, it's programmed with 22 built-in scales, and also you can create your own custom scales. Plus, you can use the speed select buttons to pitch bend up and down a semitone. Now, this all works with Serato or with actual final records. And by the way, all this stuff is MIDI mappable. If you want to connect a MIDI keyboard and play your turntable using that, you can do that. 
Now, of course, Pioneer DJ had a strong presence at NAMM. They gave lots of demonstrations, and they had setups where people could walk by and try scratching on their PLX line. Though these things have been out for a few years, so nothing new to report there. And then there's these new old Technics, which are great, I guess. I mean, they're great in that they're familiar, but not so great in their price point or their archaic feature set. I mean, they're not really any different than my old Mark IIs here. But no matter what, there's one thing I will say. I'm happy that all these things exist. Honestly, DJ turntables were nearly wiped out a few years ago, but the resurgence of the popularity of vinyl has saved these old tanks, thus furthering the preservation of this classic DJing format. Now, there was a lot of engagement on the YouTube channel for the Technics turntable. Um, a lot of people were talking about the price, and some people commented that now Technics is saying that the price is going to be $9.99, which is still pretty high, some people are saying, compared to all the features offered by other turntables, offered by Reloop and other brands. Uh, one commenter says, $1,400, no way. The top commenter says, I admire any DJ that would use the Technics turntable with a non-digital mixer and an audio interface from any manufacturer and play for an entire gig with no fancy cue points, no sampler, just running music the old school way. And that's fair enough. That's a sort of a personal preference. Uh, but what's being kind of argued here is, is it worth the price point um, or is Technics just sort of resting on their name, which is kind of what I'm arguing. Now, I couldn't leave NAM this year without talking to the people at Phase. Now, Phase is like a little doohickey that attaches to the spindle of your uh, turntable record player and basically gives you a sort of wireless time code signal, signal so that you can use uh, something like Serato or Tractor DVS to be able to manipulate records uh, but control digital files such as MP3s. But you can kind of bring your own turntable, slip mat, vinyl combination, if that makes sense, because this is just a device that attaches onto the spindle. So it sends through a wireless protocol, it sends this information uh, to a little receiver, which then goes to your DJ software. And uh, next thing you know, you're doing scratching and beat juggling and everything that you want to do on any record that you want to. Uh, but really, you're just actually manipulating this little device. It's pretty neat. And it's made a lot of waves in the DJ tech industry. Uh, but a lot of people have complained about how long it's taking for this thing to come out. And so phase was there, I walked up to the people there got a couple of demonstrations and then ask them straight up, when is this thing coming out? And here's the result. One of the products that a lot of people were curious about this year at NAM is the long anticipated phase. Now phase works kind of like timecode records uh, without the timecode records. You see, phase is a handy little gadget which sends a timecode signal over a super high-speed proprietary wireless protocol. Now what that means is that you can manipulate your digital files, say an MP3, by placing a phase device over any preferred piece of wax. Now these units use accelerometers or black magic or something to scratch and move your Serato tracks with a surprisingly low latency interface. As they say on their website, Phase provides the quality and comfort of controllers, but the feeling and accuracy of real turntables. Phase is the first wireless controller that allows you to use timecode without needing cartridges or control vinyl. Now, Using the two audio remotes, the turntable rotation information is transmitted wirelessly to a receiver. Now, I've got to hand it to them. There was a lot of wireless activity at NAMM, but they didn't seem uh, phased by it. Now, people have been giving this company a hard time about this thing since it seems to keep getting talked about but never seeing a release. So, I went to the Phase booth at NAMM to ask the representatives straight up when Phase is supposed to come out. We are absolutely on track for March. March, March is coming. <laughs> the answer is March. Okay, so I'm here with Camille and we are looking at the impressive Phase system behind me there. And uh, I've been watching some demos of that thing and I'm really impressed with like the latency and the performance of this thing. Um, so I, I think what a lot of my audience wants to know is like, is this thing really coming? 
I take the opportunity of this video first to thank you all, everybody who is supporting us since the first day. Uh, we're really excited for the release coming in March. Uh, so now we are absolutely on track for March. March. March is coming. <laughs> really proud to be uh, at the NAM uh, this year again. Uh, last year we introduced the very first prototype, and now these products are the final ones. All the hardware part is now. Uh, so these will done. be the production units that we're seeing here. Yes, uh, we're awesome. still improving the firmware, the software. Okay. Uh, so that's the thing we, we can do remotely. The face has been designed for any DJ using DBS technology. Uh, either scratching, mixing, any practice. Like, uh, we wanted it to be universal and compatible with any setup. Uh, any DJ software, so tractors, Serato, record box, and I love that, that it's not specific to any particular yes. platform. Yeah, and we wanted people to keep their own gears, uh, keep their habits, and don't like they don't need to buy new stuff. Uh, right. That phase, uh, phase is uh, adaptable to their uh, practice. And I heard something about it's on a constantly rotating frequency or something like that to make to help with the um, interference. Yes, And uh, absolutely. one thing that I've noticed is like with there, I mean, there are thousands of people here, yes. and they're all doing what I'm doing. They've got their phones out, yeah. they're all transmitting data and live streaming and doing all these things. And I haven't really seen it even pick up. I mean, the communication is uh, is really strong and really unique. Like you can have several phases in the same room. Um, each remote is paired to each receiver, okay. so there is no interference, and the communication is, as you said, continuous. Like um, always searching for better frequency if the frequency is getting low. Okay. Now one more thing I wanted to make sure I covered uh, surrounding NAM 2019 this year was all the new tractor stuff. Being a Native Instruments fan myself, I was very interested in this and kind of had a dog in that race. And so, of course, Native Instruments released a new tractor related app uh, while NAM was going on. So let's go have a look at the latest from Native Instruments. Now, Tractor DJ 2 is a new app which takes the original Tractor DJ, rebuilds it from a new code base, carries over some of the functionality, and then makes it cross-platform so it can be used on PC or Mac as well as iOS. Uh, no word yet on an Android release, but to be clear, Tractor DJ 2 is the successor of the Tractor DJ app from iOS. This is a separate program from Tractor Pro 3, which is Native Instruments' flagship DJing software. Now, according to NI, this new app, quote, lets everybody mix anywhere. They seem to be wanting it to be somewhat accessible for non-DJs, uh, claiming that it's designed for you to get spinning straight away, whether you've been DJing for decades or somebody's just passed you the aux cable for your first mix. Now, jumping on to the trend for streaming support, Tractor DJ 2 supports integration with SoundCloud Go Plus, giving you immediate access to over 150 million tracks. The app will also support the Tractor Control S2 Mark III at launch, and in fact, the app's going to be included with the S2 going forward. As for other controllers, NI has kind of left this somewhat vague. On the website, under Will Tractor DJ2 Work With My Controller, the answer is, at launch, the Tractor Control S2 Mark III, Tractor Control Z1, Tractor Audio 2 Mark II, and any other audio interface will be supported. Okay, so the app will support any audio interface, but it doesn't fully answer the question about controllers. Will it support, for example, the Control S4, even with only a two-deck mode? Now, the iOS version of this app costs $8.99, while the desktop version is $49, uh, unless you're an S2 owner, in which case you get it for free. Now, at this time, it doesn't really seem like there's much reason to outright buy the desktop version of this app. If you're going to buy desktop DJ software, you might consider Tractor Pro 3 instead. But NI does actually seem intent on this version being the way of the future. While Tractor DJ and Tractor Pro code bases will continue to be developed in tandem for a long time, the website mentions a desire to eventually move over to the new code base for their overall product line as it matures. Quote, Tractor DJ 2 is based on an entirely new code base that will set Tractor up for the future. Tractor Pro 3 remains the most advanced incarnation of Tractor. It's used by professionals worldwide on a daily basis and will continue to be our flagship DJ software for years to come. Tractor DJ 2 and Tractor DJ Pro 3 will therefore be developed and updated in tandem in the coming years until we and our professional users consider the new platform to be mature enough to make the switch. 
NI has explicitly stated that the Tractor Pro 3's code base makes it much harder to integrate third-party services, and SoundCloud integration with that program is not currently possible. Now, this isn't the first time this has happened. Old school Serato users who had older SSL boxes will likely remember the switch to the newer Serato DJ version. And some of you more stubborn ones probably still haven't upgraded. But anyway, the point is if you're a Tractor Pro user, you might think of Tractor DJ 2 as a place to see where Native Instruments' head is at with new and upcoming features rather than a necessary move you need to make anytime soon. For the more casual user, it'll be interesting to see if they can accomplish something that Algorithm has already been quite successful with in their DJ line of products. Of course, the main draw there is probably the Spotify integration, which is arguably better than SoundCloud integration. Another thing that was announced while I was at NAMM had to do with Tractor Pro 3, and that's the fact that in an upcoming update this month, a highly requested feature is coming, and that is Parallel Waveforms. Also, the Control S4 Mark III is finally getting its promised standalone mixer mode, uh, meaning that it can operate as a mixer without an attached computer, uh, for example with turntables, not that it can play directly from USB. So that wraps up all the major stuff I covered during my adventure to NAM, but there were a few other things worth mentioning that I just didn't get around to creating a video about. Jim and I showed off their all-in-one unit, no doubt noticing the hot trend in that department, uh, which is called the SDJ 4000. It seemed to have pretty decent build quality, and it uses Gemini's own software, and it's essentially a cheaper alternative to the Prime 4 or maybe the Pioneer XDJ RR. Now, besides all the tractor news, Native Instruments also released a new three-octave keyboard called the M32, which is compatible with their complete control plugin, but is much more portable than, say, my S61, and it contains transport controls and touch strips and so on to control your studio software. And I also released the Audio 1 and Audio 2 sound cards for very basic connections for those needing inputs on stage. And Hercules had their entire lineup of beginner DJ gear on display at the show. I spent some time talking with their representative as well, and no doubt I'll be putting together a video about Hercules stuff soon. So that's going to wrap it up for 2019 recap of the NAM show. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. Um, hope there's a piece of gear that's exciting to you. To me, that Denon Prime 4 is just an amazing piece of gear. Uh, it's kind of an exciting time to be alive uh, if you're into the whole digital DJing space. Uh, that Akai Force just looks like a lot of fun. Um, and as much as I kind of worry about the price point and so on about the Techniques turntable, I really am glad to see that uh, so much innovation and so much uh, care and thought is being put into, you know, making sure that these turntables stay alive. Um, there were a lot of turntable options there. There were a lot of people scratching. And it was just kind of cool to walk in and see all these different people interacting and all these different DJs uh, battling and scratching and just having fun and uh, pushing buttons and that's pretty much going to wrap it up thank you guys so much we will be back next week uh, we have an episode coming up with our friend b-funk we also have an episode coming up with dj corrupt out of columbus a great dj producer you're going to really appreciate both of those interviews but for now take care this has been the passionate dj podcast peace